I'll say this, a number of years ago, someone came up to me and said, hey, Steve, uh, who's your favorite person in Scripture not named Jesus? And I thought about that for a second. I'm like, oh, Ananias. Not the dude who stole money from church, bad dude. But there's this other guy named Ananias who I think is incredible. And so if you have a Bible, turn with me to Acts chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible, no worries. We put it in the bulletin. If you've got a small black Bible like me, it's page 883. If you brought your Bible, I'm sorry, I can't help you. It's just the book of Acts. Verse 10 says this, in Damascus. Now, Damascus is 150 miles from J-Town, from Jerusalem. In Damascus, there is a disciple. And disciple in Hebrew is the word Talmudim. And to be a Talmudim is to be an apprentice of a rabbi. To be a Talmudim, you had high desire and high devotion to be like your rabbi. So 150 miles away from the religious center, which was Jerusalem, in modern-day Syria, Damascus, there is a Talmudim, a disciple. His name is Ananias, and I love what it says, verse 10. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. And I love his response, yes, Lord. I love this because I want to let you know, friends, that the supernatural begins when you say yes to the whispers and to the promptings of God. And I believe on the regular, God is whispering and prompting and inviting each and every one of us to be a part of his grander story of redemption. The problem is, is for many of us, we often are too distracted, too insecure, uh, too kind of like stressed or overwhelmed or just, just not even having an ear tuned to heaven. And what's so beautiful in this moment is when you see God whispering to Ananias, and he's like, yes, Lord. And then God, in his kindness, gives Ananias some clear next steps. Look what the text says. Verse 11, the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. I love it because God's like, Ananias, yes, Lord. And then God's like, all right, here's what I need you to do. I need you to make a right on Portola. I need you to get on the 141. I need you to drive to the 405, get off on Jamboree, go to Judas's house on Straight Street, and there's a guy there that you need to talk to. And here's the crazy thing, is when we're open to God, God's going to give us clear instructions on what the next best right step is. I remember a number of years ago, I was in Bujumbura, Burundi, real place in Africa. And I was there because a team of us had raised all of this money that we were going to give to some women so that they could start businesses to help their family, to help the local church, to advance the kingdom of God. But the problem was there were three political officials who had not given us clearance to give the money to the women. And so we had been calling, emailing, doing whatever we could. We got to the point where we all flew to Bujumbura to have an intervention to try and figure out how we can get this money to these women. So I fly late at night to Bujumbura. I show up early the next morning to this meeting. It's being led by this world-class business leader. This business leader is looking at each of us and he's like, you all know the problem. We gotta solve this problem. You're here for a reason, solve this problem. But the problem was, we didn't have any ideas to solve the problem. And this business leader was so good that he's like, you all are wasting my time. So it's 10.30, and he goes, this is what I'm going to do. I'm dismissing all of you. And there's eight of us. You have the rest of the morning and the entire afternoon, but at dinner time, every single one of you must come with one good idea, dismissed. I was like, man, this is, I thought this was like a Christian company. This is intense. <laughs> Put my backpack on. I'm like, oh, what am I doing here? I'm walking. I look at my friend. I'm like, man, what are you going to do? And he's like, bro, I'm going to take a nap. I'm tired. I'm like, God does speak through dreams. It's biblical. So I go to the hotel. I'm about ready to, to take a nap. And I put some basketball shorts on. And, and then I feel this sense, whisper, prompting from God to go for a run. And obviously, I don't run. And so, like, I, I'm sitting here, like, what? I've never been to Bujumbura. And so I just start running through downtown Bujumbura, like, passing some UN vehicles, and I'm running. What felt like a 10K was probably less than a 1K, but I'm just running my heart out. And I finally come to the, the, the city center, and there's about 500 people around a basketball court. 
So I stand at the baseline, and I'm just kind of watching the game. I'm there 60 seconds when some guy walks up to me, and he pokes me, and he goes, you good? I'm like, yeah, man, I'm all right. He goes, no, you good in basketball. I'm like, well, I mean, I'm all right. I, I, I played basketball at Cal State Fullerton. The word play is probably not the right word. I sat the bench, but I got free shoes. And so I have this moment where he's like, you good in basketball? I'm like, I'm okay. And he goes, okay, hey, you, you're out, you're in. I'm like, what is going on? I haven't even warmed up. I'm like, what am I doing? So I start playing. The next 90 minutes, we go 6-0. and oh. We finish. This guy comes out with a basket filled with Burundi dollars. And he goes, tomorrow, same time, championship game. And I'm like, bro, I, I didn't sign a contract to join the BBA, the Burundi Basketball Association. You're paying me right now? I'm definitely going to add that to my LinkedIn account. But, like, I, I'm here for meetings. I can't, I can't come back tomorrow. He goes, who's your meetings with? I'm like, oh, here's the deal. We raise all this money, try and get to these women, but there's these three political figures who won't literally give us clearance. He goes, what are their names? I read all off the number of names. And he goes, I'm the second one. I'm like, check your email, bro. He goes, I have a deal for you. I'm like, what's your deal? He goes, this. We win game tomorrow, I take meeting. So now I go back to the dinner meeting with one good idea. Let's go. I'm listening to all these jokers sit down. They're like, well, maybe we can just show up early and catch them before the people come in. I'm like, bad idea. And finally, they're like, Carter, what do you think? I'm like, I'll tell you what I think. I know God loves football. I know God loves baseball. But I know without a shadow of a doubt that God loves the game of basketball. Can I get an amen? And, and I start to tell the story. The guy who's leading the meeting goes, yeah, I, don't, I don't care what you need to do. If you need to go to your room right now, you need to get a massage, you need to order the fanciest ribeye, you do whatever it takes to win that game. We win that game, they take the meeting. Why do I tell you that story? Because it's so weird. But this is how God works, isn't it? I mean, if we ended up just passing a mic, what's your only God story? 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 The thing is that the God of all creation wants to use broken and beautiful people like you and me. The question is, will we let them? And in this moment that's so honest that God goes, Ananias, you're my disciple, high desire, high devotion, Ananias. And he's like, yes, Lord. And God's like, all right, here's what I need you to do. I need you to do this, do this, do this, go here, talk to this guy. And Ananias is just like me. Because I, I get those instructions and all of a sudden I start making excuses. God gives me an opportunity and I start like second guessing it. God gives me a chance, and I'm like, nah, are you sure? Was that God? Was that bad pizza? Like, what, what was that? And look what it says in the scriptures, verse 13. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. He has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. It's like Ananias is going, God, I know you are the creator of all things. I just don't think you've been watching the news. You know who this guy is? His name's Saul. And this guy's gotten permission from the religious leaders to shut down this move of Jesus. And this guy, this guy gave the okay to kill a man named Steve. Why would you kill a guy named Steve? <laughs> and, now, and now he's on horseback in his Air Birkenstocks and he's coming 150 miles because a few of us here are just talking and trying to live out the way of Jesus. And he's coming here. And you know what he wants to do? He's probably going to arrest me or beat me, maybe even kill me. It's a trap, God. You don't want me to go there. You don't want me. I remember a number of years ago, I was in Palestinian territory. It was in Bethlehem at the Intercontinental Hotel, and their Wi-Fi went out, which is a natural disaster of epic proportions. And I, I saw on my phone that across the street, there was a hookah lounge that had free Wi-Fi. So I decided to cross the street, stand outside the hookah lounge, and steal free Wi-Fi. And so I, I'm walking across the street, and as I'm walking across the street, I see out of the corner of my eye four Palestinian soldiers in fatigues with massive guns, 
And probably a three iron from where I am is a massive security barrier wall kind of dividing Israel from this Palestinian territory and Israeli soldiers who are just eyes locked on these four Palestinian soldiers. It's about one in the morning. And I'm walking across the street and I hear one of those whispers from God, go talk to those soldiers. You know what my response was? Give me free Wi-Fi. <laughs> so I'm like, man, God, like, I don't, what am I gonna say at 1 a.m.? I start making excuses. I see the guns, I see the fatigues. I, I just, in my own sense of subconscious bias, I just start finding going, I don't, I don't know. And then finally I'm like, man, okay. I've had enough of these moments where God's just worked that I'm like, all right. I walk up and I, I don't know what to say. So I'm like, man, it's a beautiful night here in Bethlehem. I'm like, what's your name? And they start going around telling them their name. They look at me and they go, what's your name? I said, my name's Steve. They're like, Steve? Like my favorite U.S. actor. I'm like, who's that? Steven Seagal. <laughs> and literally the words that came out of my mouth were like, God, you can use all things for good. <laughs> we start connecting, chopping it up. I'm like, hey, man, like, where, 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 where are you guys from? One of them goes, I'm from Balada. Three of us live in Balada. I'm like, you live in Balada? I literally have taken a team from Orange County to here and one of the places in two days, 48 hours, we are literally going to tour Balada. Now, Balada is a U.N. refugee camp. It's the size of 1.3 square miles, and over 35,000 people live there, literally on top of each other. It is wild. So I was like, hey, would you, would you just give us a tour? The three of them were like, yeah. I was like, awesome. Meet at this time, show up, but don't bring your guns. They're like, okay. They give us a tour. At the end of the tour, we meet back at the gate. I'm like, guys, you ever been to this building over here? They're like, no, what is it? Like, you've never been. It's like right outside the city gates. You've never been there. They're like, no. To church. You gotta come, you gotta come. They, they won't let us in. I'm like, oh yeah, they will, trust me. They're like, the church is for anyone and everyone. Come on, come on, come on, come on. So we w end up walking in. I take them into this church. We go down to this basement. It's all these old school Byzantine tiles. And then at the bottom of this basement is a well. And the well still has unbelievable water. And this is the well where Jesus in John 4 meets with the Samaritan woman. The scripture says in John 4 that Jesus had to go to Samaria, but the truth is no, he didn't. Because no rabbi went to Samaria. But my Jesus goes to the places where the marginalized are. And Jesus, the scripture says, had to go. And so in the minute of John 4, Jesus begins to talk about desire, which is a beautiful conversation. Because we all have desires, good desires. Desires to be used. Desires to help. We have good desires that God has planted within us. And so in the midst of this moment, recognizing I have three Palestinian, non-practicing Muslim Arab soldiers with me, a preacher's going to preach standing by a well. And so all of a sudden I start talking about desire. I'm like, what do you desire? I think for some of us we desire shalom. It's like heaven invading earth. In Arabic, it's, it's the word salam. This idea of like heaven invading earth. It's peace. And Jesus in John 4 talks about he is our living water. What we thirst for, what we desire, that peace that we hope for, it can literally happen in our midst with him, by him, in him, and through him. And so I start bringing up water, and it's really good water. It makes Dasani very jealous. I bring up this water, and I'm like, does anybody thirsting for Jesus? Anybody thirsting for this good news? Anybody? The first people to come forward, Palestinian soldiers. So now I'm like in my mind going, did I do the gospel call well enough? So I start to like overcorrect. I'm like, no, no, this is what I'm talking about. And they're like, we get it. We want that. They drink, we have this moment of prayer with the, my friends from, from OC and we like pray over these guys. They end up, one of them gives me his necklace. Another guy, he's like, I have nothing to give you except my senior picture. And he gives me his senior picture. And the most beautiful thing, the most redemptive thing, the only redemptive thing of Facebook is that I can stay in contact with these guys. One of them lives in Dubai, one lives now outside of Bethlehem, and God is at work in their life. Here's what I want you to understand. I was looking for free Wi-Fi, and God was looking to expand heaven. You walk into Starbucks, and you're looking for your, like, mocha frappuccino, like with ice or whatever the thing is, and then you just shake and just kind of go to a little dance move with it. You're looking for that drink, and you're looking to get in, get out. You're looking to do your job and make sure that the numbers hit Q1, Q2. You're going through your neighborhood, and you're just trying to get into your house and not see and recognize any one of your neighbors. And we're just trying to be as efficient and clear 
and go from point A to point B as quick as possible. And I think we're missing the opportunity to be used by God. God is constantly looking to expand heaven, and he wants to use you and me. And Ananias goes, God, I don't know, man. I don't think I can do it, but I love what God says. And I think he says these words over every one of us who are disciples. It doesn't matter your age. I think God is saying this to each of us. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. See, the truth is sometimes we zoom in on somebody else's past. We zoom in on what we think that they will say. We zoom in on their differences. We zoom in on like, there's no way that they would come to service. There's no way they would say yes to Jesus. There's no way. And we've like zoomed in on one part of their story. And heaven is like Google Earth. It's like literally zooming back going, I see not just what they've done, I see what their life can be if Christ were at the center, if they were filled with the Holy Spirit, if they had grace and hope and peace and an understanding that they are loved because of the one true God. And this has been wrecking me because it's so easy to see what divides us rather than what unites us. And continues on, verse 17, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, brother Saul, not murderer Saul. He says, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Friends, I got one question for you today. What if Ananias said no? I, I, this is maybe just how I think, but it's true what the scriptures tells us is that God is everywhere. God's here. In this moment, God's here. But God's in Costco, God, 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 God's in traffic, God's in your neighborhood, God's in your school, God's in the marketplace. God is everywhere. And if God is everywhere, then that means every moment is brimming with redemptive potential. Which means God is actually wanting to use you and me to fulfill his redemptive purposes and plans. But here's the problem. What if God, the God of all creation, is like, Ananias! Here's what I need you to do. And Ananias was like, no. Like God's got to go to somebody else in Damascus. And what if they say no? And God's got to go to somebody else. And what if they say no? And God's got to go to somebody else. And what if they say no? The same thing's true here, Saddleback. God is whispering all the time. And what if we're like, no, not now. No, not today. No, 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 not, not, I, I, I'm too busy. No, 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 I, I just can't. You couldn't use me, God. There's no way. And all of a sudden, if God starts going to one after another, after another, after another of people who called this saddle back home, and we're all telling God no to those whispers and promptings, here's what happens. Family begins to break down. We lose kind of the values of heaven, and culture begins to kind of just start to fracture and splinter. It affects cities and counties and states and countries. And the truth of it is, is heaven doesn't become what God longs for it to become, a place where everyone can be welcomed when they say yes to Christ. So the crazy thing about it is God actually created this whole story where he wants to use you and me, which I don't even think is a great idea. But this is what God decided. All the other religions, they want to tell their story through buildings and idols and other stories. God, from the jump, begins to take dirt and begins to shape and form like this amazing artist. He breathes life into the being and he puts his image into humanity. Every one of us has this imago day, has the image of God, so that every one of us can teach each other about who God actually is like. And God said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell my story not through buildings and idols. I'm going to tell my story through my people, through you. And what's amazing, if Ananias says, no, I'm not going to let you tell your story through me. I'm not going to go. What if Saul never said yes to Christ? What if nobody actually came to see Saul? And Saul, we know, becomes Paul, and Paul writes the majority of the New Testament. 
And you've all read Romans, the theology of Romans, First and Second Corinthians about spiritual gifts and the values of the church, Galatians, the fruit of the spirit, Ephesians, worship and identity of who we are and what we're called to be. Philippians, how to have joy in the midst of circumstances that make no sense or unexpected pain. Colossians, the supremacy of Christ. I mean, I could go on and on. And if Ananias doesn't show up, we might not have the writings and our Bible might be a lot smaller. People come up to me all the time like, we need more Pauls in the church. Well, you don't get a Paul unless an Ananias shows up. My friends, we are everyday Ananiases. And when you actually believe that the God of all creation wants to whisper and use you to be a part of his redemptive plan, then it changes the way you enter into every room. It changes the way that you see people. It changes the way that you experience God. And I'll tell you what, friends, your faith and your relationship and your ability to hear God and live for God is radically enlarged. And I want this for you. And so I want to teach you the four marks to be an everyday Ananias. Number one is you live deep with Jesus. Acts 9, 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple. There was a Talmudim. There was an apprentice, a disciple of Jesus. High desire, high devotion to be like the rabbi. And it starts with living deep with him. In Bible college, I was taught, when you preach, keep the main thing the main thing. Which makes sense. Preach about Jesus, which I love. But you know what Jesus taught? John 15. Ten times in the first ten verses, he uses the word remain. And some translations say the word abide. And abide comes from the word abode, which literally means to make your home in. And what Jesus taught was to keep the remain thing the main thing. To everywhere you go, recognizing that you're entering into the presence of God. That any moment can be sacred and holy. Any moment that you can join with God, partner with God in his redemptive plan. And when you begin to live deep with Jesus, you begin to live for him. And when you live for him, all of a sudden you begin to see and hear his heartbeat for all of humanity. Number two, you show up with expectation. When you show up, man, you, you come in and you're like, I know God's here. I know God's at Starbucks. I know God's at, at, at Nordstrom. I know God is here. I know God is here. And if God is here, he's up to something. And so it's like head on a swivel. You're just looking, God, who do you want me to engage with? And then number three, you relate with everyone. You relate with everyone. Because this has always ever only been about people. And the single greatest gift that every one of us can give to another human being is an introduction to a God who loves them. And you look for those moments that, that you can relate with people. And we're all different. And some of you love fly fishing. Some of you love being outdoors. I love sports. I think my, my top spiritual gifts are preaching and trash talk. And then faith. Those are my... And truth be told, if I see someone at LAX and they're, they're walking, they've got some sports paraphernalia on, I'll chop it up with them. I saw a, a guy a couple of weeks ago. He was wearing a University of Alabama shirt. I walked up to him. I don't know this guy, but I walk up to him and I'm like, hey, excuse me, sir. He's like, yeah. Can you just help me with one thing? He's like, yeah. How can a man who has from his shoulders up just have the face of integrity, but over his heart has such depravity? The guy's like, what? I'm like, I'm just kidding, man. You're an Alabama fan. Your team always wins. I'm frustrated. I'm a Michigan fan. I thought this was our year. It wasn't, but it's okay. I just can't stand how you all win. He jokes. He laughs. I said, you, he asked what I do. I said, I'm a preacher. He was like, oh, that's awesome. And then he's like, I, I said, you know, my favorite Bible verse is? He's like, what? I'm like, it says, Jesus said once, get behind me, Saban. And so I, I like, <laughs> and he died laughing. We just start chopping it up, right? I get to hear his story, I get to connect, but all it was is I looked for something in the most like winsome way, and then I just offered up a word of encouragement. It's not hard. If you see someone who's super patient, affirm them. Has anybody ever rejected you when you tried to encourage them? When you just say, hey, I just want you to know your patience or your kindness or your goodness it was just like something that was so beautiful and moving. Has anyone been like, hey, you knock that off. You do not encourage me. I want none of that. I want you to be cynical, and I want you to be sarcastic, and I want you to shame me. No, nobody ever does that. 
But we like have lost this art of like literally relating with people, engaging with people, affirming people, calling out the imago day in another. And so when you live deep with Jesus, you show up with expectancy, you relate with everyone. Lastly, you'll be able to risk it all for what matters most. And risk has become this acronym for me. And I just want to teach it and hopefully challenge, inspire, and remind you how you can be an everyday Ananias R. Rescue people, rescue people. Rescued people, rescue people. Now here's the truth. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I was in seventh grade and I I was playing basketball and there were these two juniors in high school And I didn't even really know that they were Christians. I just knew something was different about them. They were funny. They were leaders. They liked sports. I just, honestly, as a seventh grader, I wanted to be like those guys. Their names were Dominic and Nathan, but they went by the name Dominate, which is just awesome. (laughs) And I'll never forget, on seventh grade, playing basketball, I'm walking to get some water. And as I get to the water fountain, Dominic looks at me and goes, hey, Carter. And I didn't even think he knew who I was. I'm sure my voice cracked. I'm like, yeah. And he just said, hey, you want to learn how to dominate life? And to this day, it's the greatest question anyone has ever asked me. You want to learn how to dominate life? For the next six months, Dominic and Nathan would pick me up and they'd take me into In-N-Out. And you know what In-N-Out is. It's where the Shekinah glory of the Lord descends in burgerly form. <laughs> they'd ask me questions about the Lord. Within six months, I'm getting baptized. I get baptized and then you know what dominate tells me? They tell me, hey, go after your parents. And I'm like, you all go after your, my parents. And he's like, no, no, no. Like this grace that you have, the story that you have, go give that to your parents. My senior year of high school, got to baptize my mom. My sophomore year of college, got to baptize my dad. And then all of a sudden, God just began working. But Dominic, Nathan, Nathan's a dad and he lives in Georgia. Dominic works in Hollywood with cameras. They just said yes to an invitation. And sometimes I think about this late at night. Sometimes I think about the day, and I hope it's not anytime soon if Dom or Nate were to pass. And God would just walk them. And they basically take both of these two guys and go, hey, hey can I just show you for a second? What you, when you said yes to my prompting to talk to that punk seventh grader, can I just, can I just tell you how many more people are in heaven because you said yes. You had no idea what you were doing, but you opened up heaven, opened up people's hearts because you said yes. And friends, this could be your story. This is what God wants. Rescued people rescue people. But I know, I know, some of you are sitting here going, Steve, you, you, probably, you probably have the spiritual gift of evangelism. You probably just love talking about the Lord. Can I just be really, really honest? You know that every spiritual gift leads people to Jesus. I mean, you got the gift of hospitality. What is that? You create safe and secure environments so that people can experience who? Jesus. You have the gift of leadership. Fantastic. What does that mean? You understand the values of heaven and you work tirelessly to instill those values in your home, in your community, in the marketplace so that people can experience who? Jesus. You have the gift of mercy. You are, what is that? You are the hands and feet of who? Jesus. Every spiritual gift leads people to Jesus. So you can't use that as an excuse. But you're probably sitting here going, you seem to like people. You probably talk to people all the time. Sometimes. You're probably an extrovert. I'm an introvert. Maybe you're sitting there, I don't don't really talk to a ton of people. I get nervous. That's okay. My wife is an introvert. I'm probably a little bit more extroverted. But you know what extroverts do? They just skim the surface. They can talk to anybody. But they just skim the surface. But for many of you who are introverts... What you are able to do is create such a safe, secure, and anchored moment where someone feels loved and seen. I'm not asking you to do this for 500 people, but for the six or seven people that you can see and feel and carry their pain, 
I'm just asking, would you just share your story or make an invitation to church? Because who knows how God might use you as an everyday Ananias to transform the heart of your friend. But I promise you, it doesn't matter if you're a pastor, it doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for many, many years, when you do this, you're gonna be told no. You're gonna make an invitation and someone's gonna say no. For so long, that kind of stressed me out. I thought to myself, man, maybe I'm doing it wrong. So I started reading all these books, maybe I gotta do it like this. And then I, I just realized it just got even more weird. I started adding more syllables to words, feeling more disconnected from humanity. And then I started to realize, I, I heard Mark Burnett, Roma Downey, they were talking about pitching shows. And Mark Burnett, you, you all know him, he created the Survivor and The Voice. And he says, I, man, I get rejected all the time. He says, I'll pitch a show and, and some producer or some company will tell me no. And I just started to understand no as an acronym that just literally means next opportunity. And something hit. Because what I realized was what I longed for is that for every one of us, we would be so clear to say yes when God whispers and prompts. I have no control over what he or she will say. The only thing I have control over is will I say yes to what God is asking me. Now, if I'm weird, that makes it very easy for them to say no. So number one world, don't be weird, okay? But if I'm honest and human, what I wanted people to understand is how do we become the kind of church, the kind of people, the kind of Talmudim disciples that when God whispers, we say yes. We have so much trust and belief that he's doing something in us and we want that more than the fear of what somebody might say, yay or nay. And so what we began to do, I, was celebrate this in our church and we called them invitational fails. And what we started to do is we started to celebrate people who felt like they heard God went out, shared a story, or shared an invitation, and were told no. I'll never forget this church in Fullerton. One of the guys, Tony, he, he worked in insurance, doing a whole bunch of numbers. He'd been praying for his neighbor, who was actually his boss, and, and he'd been praying that God would actually give him a, a moment, a chance to make an invitation. And so I asked, hey, anybody got any invitational fail stories? Tony raises his hand. He's quiet, introvert. Tony goes, man, I got a story. I'm like, what's your story? He goes, I've been praying for my neighbor, praying for my boss, hoping that someday, someday, I could just invite him to church. And we're like, and? And he goes, and then he showed up in my office. And I felt God just say, go for it. So I said, boss, man, what do you, what do you, what do, you do on the weekends? And my boss says, I, I, I watch football. And I said, cool, well, you wanna come to church with me? And he goes, no, and then he left my office. <laughs> and the whole church was like, yeah, Tony, you went for it. And we just started to celebrate. We want to be people who respond so quickly to God's promptings. And if someone tells us no, that's all right. Next opportunity. Next opportunity. See, here's the thing. You have a story of grace. Uh, my son, uh, he loves creatures. He loves animals. And when he was six, my, my dad built him a bat house. And my father-in-law built him a birdhouse. And so we go in the backyard and I could bring out a ladder and I've gotten all this bird seed and, and like a trash can. And, and so like I put the bird seed down and the bucket down and, and I'm telling my son, and you parents know this, you know, when you're trying to teach your kids something and you're like giving clear instruction and then you realize they're not even listening. That's always fun. But I'm trying to tell my son, all right, here's what we're going to do. We put the birdhouse up. I got some bird seed. We're going to put the bird seed in the birdhouse. Bird's going to come in and then move in and then pay us rent. That's what's going to happen. And so I'm telling my son this, and then he's not listening. And I look down. I'm like, Emerson, what are you doing? And I watch him with this bucket of bird seed going through the backyard going, hey, buddy, hey, birds, I want you to know you're welcome here. You can come here. It's safe. We love you. We would love for you to be here. And I'm like, dude, hey, hey, hey. Bird seed in bird house. Bird lands in bird house, moves in, pays rent. And he goes, no, no, dad. I want them to know that they are safe here. And he's just, and I know some of you are like, he's making a mess right now. I know, I know I am, I know, I know. That's the point, that's the point with grace. We just gotta scatter grace everywhere we go. And here's the thing, right? 
I love what Dallas Willard says. Dallas Willard says, we saints ought to burn through grace faster than sinners ever could. Let's go. That's good right there. And here's the thing, though. Many of us, many of us who have this story of healing and freedom and redemption, all the ways that God has done this amazing thing, which just, by the way, when I thought of this idea, I didn't know that, like, birds literally could fly in through this building. Now I'm just waiting for, like, the Spirit of God, like a dove, to be like, I'm welcome here too. But here's the thing, like all of a sudden just scattering. But I think for many of us, if I'm really, really honest, many of us within the church, <laughs> remember the Andy Griffith show? Remember Barney Fife? He had like one bullet. And he was just, every day he wanted to use that bullet. And like someday he's like, this is the moment I'm gonna use that bullet. And he's like, un button the shirt and they pull out the one bullet and I think some of us are like that with grace and we're like man I got this one seed of grace and I'm just holding on to it man and I just got to make sure that there's like the perfect moment the perfect situation they're like the, they're like in a moment where they're weepy and they have just had a terrible moment in their life and then I'm going to take this one seed of grace and I'm going to throw it at them as hard as possible and hopefully they say yes and I'm like guys like no like, you've got this story. What if we saddle back? Just where people were like, yeah, I'm just going to start throwing seeds of grace everywhere. It's going to be a little messy. I'm going to be rejected. People are going to tell me no. It's going to feel like a junior high dance all over again. But it's okay. Because you know what? I'm saying yes when God prompts. What about you? <laughs> rescue people, rescue people. I, invitational fails. And then here, S is my challenge for you. Seven days. Seven days, and you're like, what does that mean? It's amazing, and sometimes I'll see people at a church, and I'll just say, hey, hey, tell, tell me the time when God was, like, so close. When, like, God was using you in such a real and tangible and powerful way. And they're like, 1984. <laughs> I was like, I was five, bro. 1984, God was alive. 1993, man, I was in flannels, man, we were like long hair, like it was amazing. And I'm like, that's almost 30 years ago. What's wild is I think some of us are living off the only God stories that happened decades ago. And we say God is real, we sing that God is a way maker, we say that God is a miracle worker, but the stories that we're living off of happened decades ago. And what I began to do was pray to God every seven days, give me an only God story. Give me a Bujumbura story. Give me a story with Palestinian soldiers. Every seven days, give me a story that just makes me step back and only utter the words, holy God. And I want that for you. Because in the course of one year, you'd have 52 only God stories. In the course of five years, you'd have 260 only God stories. In the course of one decade, you'd have 520 only God stories. I went to college. And imagine this. Imagine this. When you have all of this adversity coming at you, but you have 200 plus only God stories, you don't see the adversity. You see an opportunity for an only God story. When you have a moment of profound struggle and pain, or you're seeing your friend go through a moment of just severe trial, you're like, yes, I see it, but I also believe God's got this because I have stories after stories after stories to back it up. But you got to be someone who's intentionally praying, God, give me an only God story. Because when you start to pray it, then all of a sudden you start to look for it. And when you look for it, you then begin to hear God whispering and God saying your name and inviting you to say yes. Rescue people, rescue people, invitational fails. Only God's story every seven days. And K, knees and prayer. Knees and prayer. Every move of God began when people were in their knees in prayer. The question is, who are you praying for right now? And seven weeks from today is Easter. And I believe that there are people in your life. We all have family drama. We all have cousin Eddie's in our family. They need hope. We, we, we all have people in our neighborhood who need hope. We all have people in our marketplace who are struggling, who need hope. And in seven weeks here, what if we were a church that were praying 
begging God, God, give me an opportunity to make an invitation. I think God would do that. I think God would use you. It's amazing is when I was in college, I was given a car. It was a 1983 Ford Country Squire station wagon with the woody paneling. Look at this. Let's go. You know what this means? I didn't have a date in college. I remember I'd drive this thing to church in Orange County, basically run through the entire fuel tank because it just was terrible gas guzzler. And I, I'd get to church, and I remember one time leaving church by myself in a big old station wagon. God just whispered, I gave you this car. Who are you inviting? I started to pray for my basketball team. I started to pray for my friends, people I worked with at Pottery Barn and, and some bars in, in Fullerton. And I just started making invitations. The most I ever got that car filled up was eight people. A couple years later, I've become a junior high pastor in Michigan, and I, I'm trying to tell my students to fire them up. Like, if your mom drives a minivan, that's a gift from God. Your dad got a, got a, a, a sedan, that's a gift from God. Pray over the seats. Name those seats. Make invitations if God gives you a chance. A couple weeks later, we have this massive event. Never forget it. Stand out in the parking lot. I'd say 98% of the seats of every car were filled with junior high students. Our ministry quadrupled overnight. And in this moment, the last car that shows up is this old station wagon. Dad gets out, opens the back, and no joke, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. It's not legal right now. 14, 15, and then the last kid, 16th kid gets out. He's got a beehive going due east, and he looks at me and he goes, it's the miracle of the station wagon, and it rolls in. <laughs> I'm like, what in the world? But I'll tell you, within a few months, eight of those kids, eight of the 16 of those kids gave their life to Christ. And those eight kids went to their junior high ministry and started scattering seeds of grace and started inviting kids to faith. Then those eight kids and all of their crew who had said yes to Christ go to high school and they're like, we're starting an, an uprising on campus. And they start scattering seeds. And God used them. And it all comes back to one kid who had a beehive going due east who named and prayed over his seats and made invitations. That's why I love students. Because you challenge them and invite them, they'll do it. What about us? God whispers, will we do it? And I'll end with this story because I really want you to do this. Seven weeks from today, Easter it could transform a person's life, not just here on earth, but for eternity. And God's looking for some everyday Ananiases. And I'll never forget my 10-year anniversary. I went to Hawaii. I had never been to Hawaii before. I saved up for a couple years and took my family. And we're staying at the top of this cliff in a condo. And, and basically to get to the water, you had to walk through three condo associations. And then you kind of came down this little cove into the water. And when it was low tide, it was awesome because you could just put goggles on. And you could just like look down on the water and there's like finding Nemo. It was stunning. I loved it. But a couple times a day, there would be a sea change. Low tide would go from high tide. And I remember it was about 5, 6 p.m. I'm grilling, looking at whales breaching. It was just amazing. And we're just flipping burgers and chicken. And all of a sudden I hear a woman scream, how? And I look out and I see waves coming in. I realize a sea change has happened. High tide's coming. And I don't know what came over me. It was the spirit of David Hasselhoff or something, but I just took off running. <laughs> I run through one condo association, next condo association, next condo association. I'm like running to the water and I'm thinking about my friends who were lifeguards. Before they went to the tower, they would pray, not on our watch. No one drowns on our watch. I take my shirt off. I start jumping in. I start swimming as hard as I can to get to this woman. I finally get to this woman. I put her on my back. I start to body surf in. I bring her in. She's not really breathing and she's just laying there. We end up resuscitating a little bit. Her eight-year-old son comes in crying. Her 13-year-old daughter comes in sort of unsure what's happening. She ends up to breathe. I exhale. I'm picking up my shirt to put it on. Random dude with Corona is like, bro, that was awesome. <laughs> and I have this moment. I'm like, oh my goodness. And then I look up to the cliff that I had run. And on this cliff, outside of all of these condos, now are 40 to 50 people who are standing outside with their arms folded, just watching. And the Spirit of God just hit me in this moment. You ran like a wild man, jumped in the water 
to save a woman that you do not even know her name. And in your actual life, you know people's names who are drowning in doubt, drowning in their marriage, drowning in their finances, drowning in matters of faith, drowning in addiction. And who are you really in your actual life? Someone who is going to rescue or someone who's standing on the cliff saying it's somebody else's job? And God rocked me. And I just found myself going through God's word and I just found myself coming to the story and Ananias and realized, man, God, God wants to use you. God wants to use me. God wants to use us. And I really, really believe that this coming Easter, God is going to do something across Saddleback, across all of these campuses. But if we're the kind of people who say, Lord, use me, if you whisper, I will say yes, because rescue people, rescue people. And if someone says no, it's okay, next opportunity, I'm scattering seeds. Because God, give me an only God story every seven days, and I'm going to keep praying. And if you keep providing, I'll keep saying yes. And who knows what you might do, but all I'm asking is that through my one and only life, you would expand eternity somehow through my faithfulness. And God, I'm asking that for every one of you. But I can't do it for you. But if you're true to live as a disciple, and you're willing to show up with expectation, and you're willing to build relationship, and you're willing to risk it all, I guarantee you, God will use you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, I come before you right now, and I think there are some everyday Ananiases right now. I think there's some names right now that you're putting on the hearts, some family members, some people who have just drifted during the last two years, some people who have just lost hope. And God, I, I think that you're gonna use every single person in this room or watching. You're gonna be whispering to them this week. And I'm praying, God, that when you whisper, they would have that kind of holy trepidation, but instead of just saying no, they would choose to say the power of yes. And that your spirit would give them words to connect and relate. And they we would be willing to risk. Because the more that we say yes to your promptings, the more that our faith grows. The more that we say yes to our, your promptings, the more that our understanding of grace grows. The more that we say yes to your whispers and your promptings, the more that our generosity grows. And so God, I'm praying that you would do a move at Easter unlike anything we've ever seen. God, I'm praying that more people would be baptized, more people would say yes to the gospel, to the good news. And that this church would be known as a place of everyday Ananiases. Because you don't get more Pauls unless some Ananias shows up. So God, let us be that. And all God's people said, amen. Grace and peace.